Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. I would like to thank each one of you for joining us from Bukhara University, Bandar Sarjana Putra Campus. I'm Hanis Aisha from Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University, and I will be moderating today's session. So today's webinar is hosted by the Faculty of Health Sciences, Masa University, and the title of today's webinar is a uh, an introduction to single photon emission computed tomography and positron emission tomography. So dear viewers, before we proceed further into this webinar session, I would like to give you a brief overview of medical imaging programs offered by our faculty uh, at Masa University. All right, so first of all, what is medical imaging radiograph or radiography? So it's actually a technique to develop a visual representation or radiograph of human body for a treatment and also for a diagnosis. Right, so imaging modalities included in this uh, field is X-ray machine, computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, mammogram, and actually many more. Okay, like in uh, today's webinar, we have PET scan, we have a SPEC scan, all right. So the importance of medical imaging in healthcare first, it is to confirm any diagnosis made by the patient, and we also uh, aid in uh, decisions making regarding the treatment and also future care of uh, issues or diseases. And it is also can be used as a preventive care like mammogram, and also to aid in surgery procedures and to track disease progression. All right, so the prospective job scope, uh, you can be a radiographer, you can be an application specialist, a clinical instructor or medical sales personnel. So the area specialization in this field uh, includes like MRI, ultrasound, uh, interventional radiography, angiography, radio surgery, and actually many more. So why medical imaging at Masa University? First, we are fully accredited by MQA and we have experienced teaching staff and we have broad clinical facilities as well as we also um, have x-ray machines for study purpose that prepare our students for clinical setting and we also offer comparable fees and this medical imaging is actually in high demand global demand in healthcare sector so you can work abroad as well so career pathway uh, depending on your qualifications we have diploma bachelor master and phd you can be a radiographer you can be medical sales executive uh, application specialist angiographer clinical instructor uh, academician and also researcher right this is uh, examples of our x-ray lab actually we all we already upgraded uh, to a new uh, x-ray machine okay this is a uh, example of classroom that we have in our university so the entry requirement uh, for diploma you have to uh, pass SPM or equivalent we pass in Bahasa Malaysia English and also five credits in the following subjects includes mathematics and one science subject which is physics chemistry biology a general science and any other three subjects for bachelor degree you must have a diploma in medical imaging or health science with a minimum CTPA of 2.57 and pass STPM or matriculation or pre -uni with minimum GPA 2.33 in two of the following subjects such as biology, physics or chemistry and mathematics. So program will be delivered um, through lectures, through tutorials, case study, clinical portfolios, group discussion as well as clinical practice. So Bachelor of Medical Imaging um, in Masa University okay, for full-time students it is four years with eight semesters for part-time it is five years with ten semesters so you have uh, we have 32 modules available okay for clinical placement you will go for five times all across Malaysia and you must um, complete 138 credit hours for diploma in medical imaging for it is uh, only offered in full time three years and six semesters we have 34 modules and 101 credit hours to be completed and clinical placement you will go for three times all across malaysia 
So this is an example of our uh, previous student who studied diploma in medical imaging. Okay, she's now a radiographer in Hamad Medical Corporation, Qatar. And currently, she is a part-time student for in a Bachelor of Medical Imaging. Okay, and another one, uh, our student is MRI Technologist in Iran, which is uh, Marzi for Kavian. Right, so that is a brief introduction for our medical imaging. If you have any info, uh, any queries or you want to uh, ask any questions, you can always contact us through MASA website or our faculty Facebook page to know more about our programs or simply just leave a comment uh, in the section uh, below and we'll get back to you. So your questions concerning this webinar as well uh, can be listed in the chat box and we will discuss uh, during the Q&A session. So moving on to our agenda today, which is the webinar. Okay. Uh, before I introduce you to our moderator, uh, to our speaker today, I would like to introduce about the topic. Okay, so it is about medical imaging, okay, uh, specifically uh, emission imaging, which works by detection, detecting radiation emitted from within the patient. So it enables clinicians to determine the, uh, the presence and size of cancerous tumors, for example, and also conduct other diagnostic procedures like coronary perfusion. So SPEC and PET scan work on the same basic principles, which they detect gamma rays. Okay, so it detects gamma rays and build a 3D picture. So this webinar aims to provide you an overview of nuclear medicine imaging techniques which is a single photon emission computed tomography and positron emission tomography. So, let me introduce you to our expert speaker for today's session, which is Miss Nadia Diti Nekama. Welcome, Miss Nadia. Hi. All right. So yes. Our expert How are you? Here today. I'm fine. How are you? Uh, uh, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we hear an uh, interesting uh, session from Miss Nadia, I would like to show you introduce. Miss Nadia holds a Master of Science in Radiation and Nuclear Safety, as well as Bachelor of Science in Diagnostic Imaging and Radiotherapy. So she started her career as a radiographer in 2005 and has been serving in the academic field more than of uh, more than 15 years so please welcome miss nadia okay uh thank you very much miss highness aisha for the kind introduction so assalamualaikum everybody and uh, good afternoon so today i'm gonna discuss a little bit of not discuss I'm going to share a little bit on the introduction to PET and SPAC. Okay, so as a disclaimer for this afternoon, I'm going to uh, say that uh, I'm not actually the expert of the field. So what I'm going to do today is just uh, a simple sharing of the knowledge of what I've read so that it can be uh, an awareness or an eye-opener to uh, those who doesn't have any idea on what is PET and SPAC is all about. Okay, so uh, moving on. So what happened to my slide? Okay, all right. So these are the outlines of what I'm going to uh, discuss today. So we have quite uh, a number of things that I'm going to discuss. But let's uh, try to make it as simple as we can and as short as we can. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, before I start talking about other things, so let's talk about what is emission tomography. So emission tomography is a term that uh, refers to a medical imaging technique which actually detects the radiation emitted from radioisotope. So this radioisotope will be injected to the patient and we will place some cameras outside of the patient and the camera will detect what are the radiation that comes out from the patient and at the end of the day, we will measure the activity emitted from the patient. So that is the idea of what emission tomography is all about. So emission tomography differs from uh, what you know, uh, the machines that we have 
uh, discuss about before this like we have discussed about what is x general x-ray what is ct scan what is mri what is uh, uh, ultrasound so these machines what do they do is that the the radiation comes from external part of the body so for for instance like general x-ray the radiation comes from the x-ray tube and we shoot the patient in emission tomography it is on the opposite way where we inject the radioisotope into the patient's body and now the patient is emitting the radiation and we place camera to detect or to measure the activity of the radioisotope so why is radioisotope okay radioisotope are unstable nuclei so things that are anything in this world which are unstable will try to go back to its original state or to the stable state. So what happened during uh, during the process of unstable being stable is that there will be a radiation emitting during the process of changing from unstable to stable. So the, the uh, unstable form of the nuclear will emit a different kind of radiation uh, in the process to become a stable from a stable form of nuclei. So that is radioisotope, something which is unstable, try to become stable, and in the process of becoming stable, it emit radiation. Okay, why is the cassette not moving? Okay, now anatomical versus functional imaging. So what is anatomical imaging and what is functional imaging? Anatomical imaging is uh, those that we use X-ray machine, we use CT scan machine, we use MRI machine. What does this machine do is this machine will try to capture images of the anatomy, of the structure of uh, what are the structure that is inside your body. So this type of imaging actually uh, produce a high resolution image where some of it will have up to one millimeter uh, slice of images like in the CT scan where you see this is a transverse cross-sectional section. Okay, so on the left hand side is the hand which is uh, the x-ray image of the hand which is taken using general x-ray. The middle image is the CT scan, a transverse section of the CT scan and on the right hand side is the MRI image of the brain. Uh, both are images of the brain. Uh, this is this image of the brain is taken using MRI machine. So what we do is we capture the anatomical the anatomical structure inside the body. Now, when we are discussing about functional imaging, what we do is that we measure the processes that are, that is undergoing inside the body of the patient. So one of the functional imaging techniques is, use, uh, is using the radioisotope, which I have already defined just now. Uh, in the, the uh, in nuclear medicine, uh, inspect and also impact. Okay, there are also other techniques which uses MRI machine that can also uh, measure the functional uh, uh, study of our body. Uh, we can also use uh, MRI machine, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, in the MRS examination, MRS stands for magnetic resonance spectroscopy. FMRI is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So it, this, this type of examination, although it uses MRI machine, it can also uh, measure the functional activity of uh, our body. Okay, now, what is PET? What is PET? Okay, PET, uh, the full name of PET is Positron Emission Tomography, and the full name of PET is Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. This is the, their full names. So what the... the uh, the, the, the big difference about these two is that in positron emission tomography, we use radioisotope that emit positron. In SPEC, 
what do we do is that we use radioisotope that emit gamma ray. So we use different type of uh, source now. So one of the radioisotope that we use in PET is fluorine 18. This is an element. Eh? Fluorine 18 is uh, an element. And one of the red, one of the sample of radioisotope that we use in SPAC is technetium 99M. Okay, these are the commonly used radioisotope for PET and SPAC. So what is PET? What is PET? Oh, sorry. So PET is a diagnostic imaging technique that we measure metabolic activity in the human body. Actually, it was developed long time ago in 1970s. And the first scanning method, it was the first scanning method that uh, give the functional information about the brain. Okay, a little bit history because we were talking about, uh, we are talking about positron now. We are, we are talking about PET. So uh, the positron, histo historically, positron is first postulated by this gentleman here, Paul Dirac, in 1928. So uh, after that, in 1932, this gentleman who's sitting here, uh, Carl Anderson, he gave the name, uh, posit uh, he gave the positron its name. This gentleman tried to actually rename electron to negatron, but he was unsuccessful. So until now, we use the word electron instead of negatron. Okay, why is positron? Positron is antimatter of electron. So it has positive one charge. So we can actually produce positron from number of sources. But in fact, we, uh, the process where we produce positron is nuclear decay. So nuclear decay means from unstable nuclear, which we use a... Uh, an instrument which is called cyclotron. Inside a cyclotron, we pick one target and this target is bombarded with proton. And uh, from this process, it produces a positron. Okay. Usually in cyclotron, uh, the process of nuclear decay will produce neutron. But for positron emission tomography, we pick a target where in the process of nuclear decay, it will produce a positron. Okay. All right. So now we have produced a positron. So what happened to the positron? This positron will, after the nuclear decay, the positron will now go out and uh, encounter an electron. So when the positron encounter an electron, it will annihilate. The process of annihilation will produce two gamma rays. If you can see here, two gamma rays. And each of the gamma rays has the energy of 511, 511 keV. And they are 180 degrees to each other. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> uh, the principle of PAC. So what happened uh, during, uh, what, what is the basic principle of PAC? So basic principle is that we use a radioisotope or also called as radioactive tracer. Uh, this radioisotope or radioactive tracer will be binded with glucose. So uh, there are a few elements that produce positron. So example that we have that I have here is carbon 11, uh, nitrogen 13, oxygen 15 and fluorine 18. So what happened is that after we have injected the patient with a uh, radio tracer, a radioactive tracer or radio pharmaceutical or radio isotope, they are, or this, they are similar. So after a few minutes, this isotope will tend to accumulate in the area that they are interested to accumulate in. Uh, that means uh, this, where does uh, the area which they have affinity towards it? Affinity means they are attracted to. So uh, what happened is that inside the brain, there are active part of the brain which will absorb this uh, radioactive tracer. So after the absorption of the radioactive tracer, uh, the image will come out 
in a different color or different degree of brightness. The pet images will come out with different degree of brightness or different colors. So this will indicate different activity of the organ or different function, uh, functional, sorry, different biochemical changes of the tissue. So uh, healthy tissue actually uses glucose. Remember, the radioactive tracer in pet is binded with glucose. So healthy tissue will use glucose for energy. So this will be also shown now in the pet images. But on the other hand, cancerous, cancerous cell also uses glucose. But cancerous cell uses glucose more than the normal tissue. So they will appear brighter than the normal tissue inside the PET images. So that is the imaging principle of PET. Okay, so like uh, what I have uh, explained just now, we have uh, fluorine 18, the most commonly used radioactive tracer, which is binded with glucose. So after it is binded with glucose, it is now called as FDG. FDG means fluorine deoxyglucose. Okay. Um, all right, so FDG molecule will be absorbed by various tissue, just like as uh, other normal glucose that we take. But if the tissue has tumors or there is malignancy inside the tissue, so they will absorb the glucose more than uh, the healthy tissue. Okay, so just now we have discussed that uh, the process of annihilation will produce two gamma rays which is in opposite direction to each other. So what we do is now we put the patient inside a, a ring of the detector. So there will be detectors surrounding the patient. And what happens is that the detectors will now uh, detect the photon and uh, it will detect where does the photon comes from. So after the detection, it will produce the PET images. Okay, so I have a short video on how does the pet uh, works. So let's see the video. Okay, all right. So that is a short video to explain on how uh, the from the moment the uh, radioactive tracer is injected into the patient and the detection of the gamma rays. Okay, all right. So after the the ring the array of detectors detects the gamma ray, what happens is that it will go to a system inside inside the PET machine. So the PET machine will then reconstruct the images from 1D, one dimension, to 2D image. And from 2D image, it will be reconstructed into three-dimensional images. This is uh, done using the software inside the PET machine. Okay, so uh, this is an image which shows the difference between normal tissue on the left lung and the cancerous tissue on the right lung. So if you can see, there's a very um, significant enhancement of brightness 
on the right lung of the patient. So you can actually see very clearly that there is a tumor or there's a cancerous tissue on the right lung of the patient. Okay, so uh, basically the video actually has already explained on how the procedure is performed. So we'll have a nurse or a technologist which inject the radioactive tracer uh, through intravenous. So after that, uh, we will uh, wait for 30 to 19 minutes so that the radioactive tracer will travel to the tissue that they, are, they have the affinity towards. Then after that, we'll scan the patient. So the process of scanning the patient will take approximately 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, so uh, for patient who has heart disease, uh, they will be scanned, uh, they will undergo a stress test where the PET scan are obtained when they are at rest. And after they undergo the administration of pharmaceutical, which alter the blood flow to the heart. So you will have two scan, which is at rest and during stress. So this is done to actually compare the blood flow to the heart tissue uh, at these two different conditions. Okay, what are the some uh, what are some other application uh, uses of for PET? So we have. Uh, Usage of PET in patient who has brain condition like Alzheimer, uh, patient who has heart condition, and uh, to detect certain types of cancer. So this is an uh, example of patient who has a brain disorder, where we have a nine-year-old patient, a female patient who has history of seizure on the right hand side. This is the the PET scan of uh, the the female uh, the patient who has seizure in comparison to a normal brain on the left side we have a nice uh, uh, shape of the brain in comparison to the right which is uh, uh, we can see the, the there are some part of the brain which is not enhanced by the radioactive tracer okay so this is the part that causes seizure to the patient. Okay, patient, uh, PET scan of the heart is also used to see the blood flow of the, to the heart muscle and uh, it, this helps to, uh, to evaluate the sign of coronary artery disease. Coronary, artery disease. coronary arteries are the arteries which lies on the wall of your heart. It's not the big uh, arteries which go out from the uh, atrium of your heart. It, the coronary arteries are the arteries on the wall of your heart. Okay, for, for those who do not know. Okay, so the PET scan of the heart is used to determine if the area of the heart shows decreased function because this is a functional imaging. So we want to see whether there are some part of your heart has decreased function. So when we combine with myocardial perfusion study, we can actually differentiate the non-functioning heart muscle and the healthy heart muscle. Okay, all right. So this is the image of the normal heart on the right hand side. So you can see the outline of the heart is very clear and nice. And in comparison to the left image, where you can see this part is not enhanced. Okay, arrow points the area which has been damaged by heart attack, or heart attack is also known as myocardial uh, infarction. Okay, in medical term, it is known as MI, not medical imaging, but myocardial infarction. So this area is actually dead tissue. Okay, cancer vision. For cancer vision, uh, we use PET to actually see uh, the advancing of the uh, cancer or the staging of the cancer because we, it is able, you are able to analyze the biochemical changes. So it, uh, you can also use to examine whether the cancer therapy, uh, the effect of cancer therapy by characterizing the biochemical changes of the cancer. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is uh, an image which show the enlarged lymph node on the left side, <coughs> left axillary lymph node, enlarged. 
and the whole body scan will reveal left breast. Uh, there is a malignancy on the left breast. So malignancy means it's cancerous. Benign means it's a tumor, non-cancerous. Okay, so uh, for Alzheimer's disease, okay, if you can see th these three images, uh, two image here uh, is taken from PET scan where on the right hand side you have an image which is, which is taken using MRI. So uh, if you look at this, the, the image of the brain taken using MRI, you can see, you see nothing is wrong with the image. It seems okay, no problem. But if you uh, compare between a normal brain on the left hand side from the PET scan image, and the uh, image of the patient who has Alzheimer, uh, the middle image, you can see a big difference between the normal and abnormal uh, uh, image of PET scan. So this is also an Alzheimer, so it shows nothing wrong. But if you do the PET scan, you can see it's very clearly that uh, the, the, there is biochemical change of the brain for the patient who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so we have settled the pet. Now let's go to the spec, okay? Single photon emission computer tomography. This is uh, the, the spec machine, okay? Uh, taken from semen. Okay, so spec uh, also provide you with 3D information or 3D image about the distribution of radio pharmaceutical which is injected into the patient. So radio pharmaceutical uh, is also radio tra tracer, it's also radio isotope. So some, uh, sometimes you can use the term radio pharmaceutical, sometimes you can also use the term radioactive tracer. So what happened is that uh, in SPAC, they combine the conventional scintigraphy with the CT so that after undergoing several image reconstruction process, SPEC will give you 3D functional information about the patient. Okay. All right. So what are the commonly used radionuclide in, in SPEC? So just now in, in PET, fluorine 18 is the most commonly used uh, radionuclide. For SPEC, the, the most commonly used is technetium 99M or iodine one, two, three. Okay, for, spe for PET just now, uh, the, the energy of the gamma ray produced is 511 keV, but for technetium 99M, it only emits 140 keV photon. So it is much lower than uh, the photon which is used in, uh, in PET uh, imaging. So uh, there's a there's also thallium two zero one which is used as myocardial agent uh, for heart scan. So this thallium two zero one it will decay into mercury two zero one. So in the process of decay, remember process of decay with radiation it emit mercury X ray. So the mercury X ray produced by the process of decay of thallium two zero one is only seventy two keV. So anyway, technetium 99M is the most preferred isotope for most clinical application in SPAC. However, if you if we are interested in uh, seeing the thyroid gland, okay, the gland here, so they will prefer uh, the iodine is more preferred because iodine has uh, high affinity towards the thyroid gland. Okay, these are the list of the commonly used radionuclide. So uh, we have uh, just now technetium 99 m uh, and thallium 201 So other than that, we have uh, the family of iodine, iodine 131 and iodine 123, and also xenon 127 and xenon 133, also gallium. So these are the half life of this radionuclide. So it varies uh, from hours to uh, this. Okay, so uh, the application of SPAC, it can be used in uh, imaging of a lot of part of the body, so for cardiac, for whole body, for brain, renal, gastric, thyroid, pulmonary, which is the lung, and also hepatobiliary. Okay, 
So for brain study, so what do we do in SPAC is that we uh, study the brain activity and also the blood flow to the brain. So from this study, what we determine is that we can determine whether the area of the brain is working well, the area of brain, brain is overactive, or the area of the brain is underactive. So from the brain study in SPAC, you can diagnose or it can show certain condition like uh, cancer, tumor, Alzheimer's disease or stroke. So you can see on the right hand side, we have a comparison of healthy brain tissue with Alzheimer, with the patient who has Alzheimer's disease. So you can see there are uh, some part of the brain that is not active for those patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And this is uh, the comparison between healthy brain and also those who has stroke. So there are also uh, a lack of activity on this part of the brain. So it is very, it has a very significant uh, difference between uh, uh, the, the healthy and non-healthy brain tissue if we study using SPAC. Okay, so we use uh, 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 two types of compound in a study of uh, uh, SPAC study of the brain. One is called as hydrophilic compound and another one is lipophilic compounds. Hydrophilic means affinity to water and lipophilic means uh, affinity to lipid or fat. So if we are using the lipophilic compound, sorry, if you are using the hydrophilic compounds, what happens is that this hydrophilic compound will go and cross the blood brain barrier. So when it crosses the blood-brain barrier, what happens is that it will be localized, it will go to the pathological site. Pathological site means the site that has disease. But it will not go to the normal brain tissue or healthy brain tissue. If we are using lipophilic compound, what happens is that this uh, compound will go and travel and go through the blood-brain barrier and it will be localized inside the normal brain tissue. That is the different uh, between uh, if you're using hydrophilic or lipophilic compound. Okay, uh, uh, there are also an examination which is called as adrenoplex cystinography, where we study the cerebral spinal fluid flow. So it can it can actually detect the uh, leakage of cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, in this study, what happened is that the radio pharmaceutical or radioactive tracer will be injected in the subarachnoid space, uh, which is uh, the puncture is done at the level of L2, L3, okay? lumbar 2 and lumbar 3. So this is the image of uh, myocardial perfusion pack. So if you can see, there are two images uh, taken during rest, resting, and during stress. So this image, uh, this two set of image will show the blood flow. Uh, uh, there are different of blood flow when uh, the patient is at rest and the patient is uh, during stress. Okay. Uh, in myocardial perfusion pack, we can also check the obstruction of blood flow in the heart vessel, or if there is any damage due to myocardial infarction. So the two uh, commonly used radionuclide for myocardial perfusion is thallium-201 and technetium-199M sestamibi. Sestamibi is the tracer. Tracer is like uh, you bind the radionuclide to the transporter and the transporter will bring the radionuclide to heart. Okay. So this is the image of uh, normal heart on the left hand side. A A is a series the series of image of normal heart, and B is the series of image uh, of abnormal heart. So this image is taken in short axis of the heart, 
this is taken at the horizontal axis of the heart and this is taken at the ventricle axis of uh, sorry vertical long axis of the heart so what can we see is that there is a very significant difference of the images uh, on the left hand side and there is defect here you can see okay uh, in, in a simpler words, there's a defect uh, in the distal portion of the heart, okay? Uh, and this is also defect in the apex of the heart. So this shows that there is uh, acute coronary syndrome of the patient, uh, most probably to the left anterior descending coronary artery. Coronary artery, remember just now? Those are the arteries that lies on the wall of your heart. Okay. Uh, this is the use of SPAC for cancer detection. If you can see on the left, uh, on the left hand side is the image of a CT scan uh, at the level of maybe cervical, cervical four. Okay, somewhere here. So uh, you can you can't really see what is wrong with the scan. So then if you combine the CT image with SPAC, so what happened is that you can see there is an enhancement on this side on, of the, the SPAC image. So this bright and lightened spot is a benign tumor in the parathyroid gland. Okay, so how does the SPAC work? So SPAC works by uh, injecting the radioactive tracer or radiopharmaceutical into the patient's body. Then the radiopharmaceutical will travel through the bloodstream and it will go to the region of interest. So when uh, it reaches the region of interest, what does it do is that it, it decays and emit gamma ray. So gamma ray will now travel out of the patient and will be detected by the gamma camera which is surrounding the patient okay so uh, after that the gamma rays will go through collimator go through these are the hardware of the spec machine go through the collimator go through the photomultiplier tube and then what happens is that this uh, uh, photomultiplier tube will convert light into electron and electron will be converted into image so this is uh, uh, um, the principle of how does the spec image is produced. Okay, I think I'm going uh, to end in a while. Okay, so uh, a little bit on the patient preparation for uh, spec. So for patient preparation, what happens is that you need to avoid caffeinated beverages, coffee, tea, uh, uh, carbonated drinks, for 12 hours before the study. So why do you need to do this? Why do you need to avoid taking caffeine instead? Because it interferes the vasodilatory medication. So during the SPAC procedure, what happens is that they will administer you with the vasodilator. Vasodilator is a medication that actually dilates your blood vessel. Okay, so other than that is that caffeine also affects the blood flow to the cerebrum. So when it affects the blood flow to the cerebrum, it influences the spec images. Uh, apart from that, you need to also avoid uh, phosphodiesters 3 inhibitor and also dipyridamol uh, uh, for at least two days. Why? Because this drug actually will work with the vasodilator, vasodilatory medication in synergy and cause uh, reduction of blood pressure, okay? So the last thing is that you need to kneel per hour for at least three hours before the procedure. And before you go up on the table, uh, please void urine to, for your comfort. So I think that's all. References, thank you. Miss Hannes? Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much uh, to Miss Nadia for such an interesting and very insightful um, sharing session. So, dear viewers, 
Uh, if you have any question for our speaker, please leave a comment on the chat box and I will read uh, for the speaker's answer the question. Yes, we have one question from Raja Fatiha. Is there any side effects to feature when undergoing this procedure? Very good uh, question. Please, with Nadia. Uh, okay, thank you, Miss Raja Fatiha. So there are some uh, side effects from uh, the procedure. So, uh, uh, the side effect or the most common complication can be divided into two. One is mild reaction. Mild reaction uh, includes uh, the reaction towards the vasodilator just now. So, it can cause uh, flushing. Uh, sorry. It can, cause, it can cause flushing, headache, uh, GI stress and light heat. And the severe side effect includes uh, chest discomfort and also arrhythmias. So those All are the right. side Thank you, Miss Nadia. So any other questions from the viewers? So while we're waiting for the viewers to ask questions, I would like to ask um, Miss Nadia, is this spec and uh, pet uh, procedures is it dangerous? Is it dangerous in terms of because it uses radiation, right? Okay, all right. So, uh, talking it about talking about risk, huh? Risk. Okay, talking about risk. When we uh, are talking about radiation, so there's a principle of radiation protection which we need to apply during the examination procedure so uh, just this uh, one of the principle of radiation protection is that to justify whether there is benefit more than risk so if the patient is indicated to undergo one of the procedure the first thing that the reference consultant needs to think about is whether this gives more benefit than the risk to the patient. So that's the first, that's the first uh, principle. The second principle is that we have to optimize uh, the radiation protection uh, measure during uh, the administration of the radioactive or administration of the radionuclide to the patient. Other than that, if we are talking about dose, the dosage of uh, SPAC and PAC is actually comparable to the uh, other radiological examination like CT scan. Okay. Let's see. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Wow. All right. From Umi Mesa, the effectiveness of this procedure to diagnose the patient. How is it effective? Uh, okay, like... Even in terms uh, of tumor detecting? In terms... Uh, okay. Uh, going back to the difference between whether... Uh, uh, between um, anatomical and functional imaging. So when we do uh, radiological examination which uh, images the anatomical structure, we sometimes know that there is tumor, but we do not know what is the what is the chemical changes or what are the characteristic of the tumor uh, used when we are uh, think, uh, when we are acquiring images using uh, CT scan or MRI. So what happened is that when we are doing PET or we are doing SPAC, which is the functional imaging, we can actually uh, evaluate more on whether there is a functional uh, changes or there is a biochemical changes of the tumor uh, in comparison to uh, anatomical imaging. Okay, so uh, effectiveness if you are looking at something about functional study, so you go to the functional imaging. If you are looking at the anatomical study, so we can go to CTMRI and ultrasound. 
Okay. I okay. hope that answers the question. Thank you very much again uh, to Miss Nadia for a very interesting topic today. So dear viewers, uh, actually we have an e-certificate provided and to be eligible for this certificate, you have to fill in a survey form that can be found in the link provided in the comment section. So uh, with that interesting sharing session and q and session, we would like to conclude today's session. So to our dear speaker, Ms. Nadia, thank you again for joining us and especially thank you for sharing with us the knowledge and um, the importance, the, uh, the risk and so on and the preparation uh, for this procedures. So to our keen and attentive viewers, thank you for joining our webinar and we look forward to your comments and particip participations in our future events hosted by Masai Industry. So if you have further queries, please contact us through Masai website and visit our social media. And again, have a nice day and thank you. Mm -hmm.